I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Don't think, feel. That's one of my favorite Bruce Lee quotes. Today on the show, we have Shannon Lee, Bruce Lee's daughter, and I'm excited for you to hear from her. She is a very good friend of mine, and I secretly, when I met her, uh, I didn't know very much at all about Bruce Lee, and I thought he was just a kind of kung fu fighting dragon martial artist guy from the movies, and... I learned a lot more through Shannon about her father and his philosophy on life. And I think that there's so much to offer our world from his thoughts and learnings. And Shannon is in charge of Bruce Lee Enterprise. She is in charge of innovating his legacy. And he has a global, global legacy. Um, I had the chance to go to Hong Kong last year with Shannon, and it would have been her father's 75th birthday. And the amount of influence and intensity and affinity to the Bruce Lee brand and and persona was incredible. Uh, But Shannon is in charge of of where this all goes. She is also a singer. She writes. She has been an actress in the past. Jack of all trades, but definitely creativity is at her core. And we talk about where this is headed and Shannon has a really unique way to articulate her father's vision and her father's words and kind of translate them. And uh, one of my goals for 2017 is to make decisions more from the heart versus just from the head. I'm a super analytical, kind of logical decision maker, and I'm really curious as to what will happen if I start really focusing on the heart a little more. And uh, that takes dipping into my intuition, which is something I'm becoming friends with and learning more about. (laughs) But um, yeah, so don't think, feel. Take a listen to my conversation with Shannon and enjoy. Before we hop into this episode, let me fill you in on a little secret of mine. That's Headspace. It's a guided meditation app, and I never imagined that doing something for 10 minutes a day could increase my quality of life so much. I've always struggled with knowing when to make things happen versus when to let things happen. Sometimes things go very well when I push on the gas, and sometimes not so much. It gets me into trouble. Headspace has helped me with learning how to trust my intuition And I've tried meditation off and on for years. It's never stuck, but this time it has. I've made a very intentional shift in my morning routine, and that's to wake up, have my coffee, do headspace, journal, and then I check my email, my social media, all of my devices. It's been a big shift, but great result. My aunt used to say, don't let anything rent space in your head for free. That's valuable real estate. Headspace allows me to be a much better landlord of my thoughts, especially first thing in the morning. You can go to headspace.com forward slash why not now for a free trial. And if you stick around to the end of the show, I'll tell you how you can get a month for free. Shannon Lee, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? 
I'm good. I'm good. Thrilled to have you on and really excited to hear your answers on some of these questions. <laughs> uh, and I have some guesses, but I'm, I'm really excited. So let's hop right in and talk about a why not now. Is there something that comes to mind right away that you think of when, when you look back and think through moments or a moment when you had to ask yourself, that critical question of why not now? And let's dissect it and we'll zoom in and talk it through. Yeah, great. It's interesting, you know, in thinking about this question, um, I have several points of view, but I'll start by saying I think my biggest sort of why not now had to do with deciding to step in and manage my father's legacy and, and all of that. I was acting. I had an acting career in my 20s and very early 30s. And I was pursuing that um, and making some strides, actually. You know, we all, we all start out in the business by, uh, I guess not everybody, but most people start out by doing some really low budget projects and then, you know, get some, uh, work under their belt and start to do more. And and I was really getting to a fork in the road where I needed to either put more energy into that or change course. And my mom came to me one day and said, you know, um, I'm thinking about sort of retiring in terms of being the person that oversees all this stuff. Uh, how do you feel about it? I don't want to put this on you just because it's your dad and all that kind of stuff. And you have your own career and your own life. And, but do you have any interest in, in doing this? And, uh, in terms of overseeing, um, you know, his legacy and the deals that come in and whatever happens <laughs> in the world of Bruce Lee. Right. And, and I, I was like, wow, I, you know, I had been already at a point where I was trying to decide what to do about my acting career, feel, feeling a little, like I said, a little unfulfilled. And then also feeling like, okay, I either need to uh, like go at this more and get more serious about this. Or, you know, if I'm feeling unfulfilled, what does that mean? Where do I want to go? And when she came to me and said that, I was like, what do I do? Cause I'd gained some, as I said, some, some, you know, steam, uh, under me and behind me in my career. And I really could have started to put that into, you know, trying to get bigger projects and things like that. And, but honestly, when she came to me and said that, I, I really just thought, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Were you expecting the question? Were you, did you kind of know this was coming? No, not really. You know, I mean, I guess in the back of my mind, I always kind of wondered, well, I wonder what's going to happen with all this stuff. And at the time it was, you know, we're talking about a time when, um, there was starting to become more of this, like deceased celebrity licensing and things like that, but it wasn't such a big deal. And we did have like, a representative in place that was handling it for the most part. So it didn't feel like, um, it was something I, I had to do. And also the attorney that was handling it at the time was also getting older and wanting to retire. And so it just meant sort of like putting in place who were going to be the guards at the gate, right. For, mm -hmm. for this continuing. But in my mind, I really thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do this, then I, I want to, I, I don't want to just sit back and, and see what happens. I want to get in there and really, because my feeling about it was my father's, uh, legacy can be better represented out in the world and it can, it can, we can shine a light on more of the totality of the man and his words and his philosophy and all this stuff that I felt really wasn't being done at the time. And so it was really a big decision of like, okay, well, if I'm going to 
shift gears here. And that's not to say I couldn't have tried to maintain an acting career, but for me, because I didn't want to just oversee and manage, I wanted to really like roll up my sleeves and get in there and decide what we could do and how we could do it better. And because I was having these feelings about my acting career, I really had to like come to this moment of like, well, do I want to continue on trying to maybe do both of these things for a while? Or do I just want to say, why not make this change? And you had gained this momentum though, right? With your acting. So it was a a pretty, you know, intentional turn. It sounds like it wasn't that you were just shelving the acting for a while. You, you kind of just decided, was it a pretty quick decision? It sounds like it was. Well, I would say in the gut, I would say all decisions usually hit you pretty quickly in your gut. You go like, oof, like you get a, you get an immediate feeling about it. And my immediate feeling was yes. But then your brain starts getting involved and saying like, well, you should really think about this. And, you know, what about your acting career? And you've, you've got some, you know, momentum now and all this kind of stuff. So you really have to, um, your brain starts becoming a problem. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm thinking of your dad's quote, don't think feel (laughs) right now. (laughs) It's perfect for this situation. And so, okay. So then, and and you then decided or did you did you tackle the universal licensing rights situation at that point or can you can you share a little bit about that journey because i'm sure there had to have been a why not now in there somewhere given it was a uphill battle and and that whole scenario is so fascinating yeah so the rights were um controlled exclusive the right to commercially use my father's name and likeness were controlled, um, by a big studio. And, um, you know, the first thing to do was just go in and have a meeting and see where we were at and and see what's going on. Really. it, It didn't dawn on me initially at all to say like, Oh, I mean, you know, we've got to get this back. I was, you know, uh, a very, I was young at that time and I didn't have a business degree and I didn't have, you know, I had to find new attorneys, uh, to help me. And and in fact, my husband was the one who helped me initially because he had gone to law school, but he was fresh out of law school and an attorney as well. Um, just starting out. So we needed to get, you know, all of our sort of troops in order and our professionals and go in there and see what's going on. And the first order of business really for me, because I just had this sense, I think with anything like what you're saying, don't think, feel with anything, you have a sense that there, something's either going well or not going well, or needs to be looked at or doesn't, you might not know what the particulars are, but you have a sense. So I, um, just had a sense that things weren't running necessarily the way that they should be. And we were in a lot of deals that had been entered into back in the seventies, you know, and, and eighties. And it was, they were old. And I, so the first thing I did was say, let's look at all the agreements. Let's look at the publishing agreements, the agreement we have with universal, what are they allowed to do and not do? Um, you know, the, the attorney that had been helping us, like all, let's just look at everything and see. And there was a lot of cleanup that needed to be done initially. A lot of people where, you know, when you're in a deal for a really long time and a lot of the players change at different, um, if there are big companies involved and stuff, things start to get loose and people start doing things that maybe they're not contractually actually supposed to be doing, or they've got materials of yours that they haven't given back or they've, you know, and, and it starts to get a little funky, especially if it's been 20 years. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to go in there and the first mode was really cleanup mode, which, which was difficult. And I would say it was hard for me in the beginning because it was so personal. I mean, to everybody else, Bruce Lee is this big name, you know, that is commercially viable out in the world, I guess. But to me, he's my dad. And so it was really hard to separate the personal from the professional in the beginning. Like people would say, you know, would be doing 
behaving badly in deals or, or being grabby about stuff. And I'm like, this is my dad. (laughs) Stop treating my dad this way. (laughs) Sure. Absolutely. I can imagine the conversations and the, the brand and the entity, but the person, you know, and the kind of juxtaposition of you having to navigate through your feelings as well. Absolutely. I had to figure that out and kind of calm down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And, and fast forward, you ended up securing the rights back, right? You got them, them back in order to be able to kind of innovate his legacy more in, in an authentic, true way to, to yourself and the family. And am I, am I kind of getting this right? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, I guess another why not that happened was as we did this cleanup work and as we tried to work within the boundaries of the agreements we had and tried to upgrade the agreements that we had and and all of that, you know, it became clear that that we, it would be great if we could have these things back and that they weren't being handled the way that they should. And, you know, the landscape is always changing, um, especially in licensing and intellectual property and all of that. And so as things were shifting and the studios were shifting and how technology and all this stuff was happening, um, it just, and, and we were being much more, um, forthright about how we wanted his image presented and what our approvals were and being very on top of all of that, which they didn't like, <laughs> they liked, they liked the days when they could just do whatever they want, whatever they want. <laughs> sure. The loose days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody likes that. Um, and saying to them, you know, Bruce Lee isn't just Kung Fu and dragons. Like he's a deep philosopher and a thinker and he le- lived his life a certain way and he stands for something and trying to get people to understand that and, and want to utilize that. And, you know, just as you're starting to get one person in the company, um, on board, then they get transferred to another division and then you have a whole new person. And sometimes that person gets it and sometimes they don't. So it was very frustrating time. And I just was like, we need to try and we need to try and get this back. And I was like, well, how are we going to do that? (laughs) Because the agreements that we were entered into were, um, in perpetuity. Um, so they didn't have to release them. And so we just started, I was like, well, we just have to try. We just have to start looking, you know, like what have we got to lose? (laughs) Which is, I think one way to sometimes, um, look at the why not question, which is, what do we have to lose? You know, if we really go for this, you know, nothing, we're going to just end up being in the same place we are anyway. So let's start figuring this out. And it was really just an amazing, um, confluence of events and circumstances that led to us being able to reacquire the right to, to commercially use my father's name and likeness back into the family. And it took, years (laughs) years <laughs> of battling and negotiating and uh, in researching how to go about it. But we just decided if we could have that back within our control, then we could, it felt like the right thing to do for my father and for his legacy. So, and against kind of all odds, right? So you're, you're up against a very big studio entity that has a ton of money and, and you're just kind of hoping, <laughs> right? Because legally you didn't really have an argument. But what was it, you know, other than the right thing to do, how did you logically kind of justify that in your mind or did something else take over to where it was just pure emotion and passion? Because from the outside looking in, a lot of people probably would have said, you don't have a chance, you know, <laughs> but it was obviously worth it. Right. And we, and we were limited in resources too, because as you say, you know, they're a big studio, they have m- millions, if not more, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, 
than that um, dollars at their at the ready. Not that they would choose to spend it all on fighting with us, but you know they they have unlimited resources financially, and we did not. And so we looked at you know legal action because you know there was there was the possibility that we could have gone about it legally and said to them, "You're not performing. We're going to sue you." You know all of that, but anybody who's ever been involved in a lawsuit or even, you know, used a lawyer for anything knows that those hours add up really quickly. Um, it can drag on for years. It's it, when you're going up against someone who has unlimited resources, it's, it's just not a smart idea. Plus, you know, you should always just avoid lawsuits whenever you can. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But at the same time, um, so we, we investigated that route, but it didn't seem like the, the, the right way to go. Um, for us, uh, it would have taken too long. It would have been very draining. And so we had to, we had to look at it from other sides, you know, like, well, could we negotiate them back? Is there, is there something that they want that we have that we can, you know, use as leverage to, in a deal to negotiate the buyback of these rights and all this sort of stuff. So there were many different ways that we looked at it and we, And as I said, the landscape was shifting. And so, but for me, I think one of the things is when I think about this question of why not now, um, a lot of times for me, the question is more about, because I'm a pretty like go for it kind of gal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) For me, the, the question often is, well, like I said, what have I got to lose? And it's, it's about holding to my principles and standing up for what I believe in. And sometimes the answer is, is why not say no, or why not say yes? You know, like why not go the distance? And so for this, like I said, uh, I just knew that if I could make this happen, it would be, um, amazing. If I couldn't make it happen, I'd be no worse off than I was before, except for a little, you know, battle weary. And, So I just kept, you know, holding again to one of my father's principles. We just kept sort of like being like water and sort of flowing and around one obstacle and another obstacle and just trying to find our path always like working our way through all of the boulders in the stream and getting, um, and continuing to make progress. And as long as we felt like we were making some progress, we just kept going and, to me, it's like, well, this is my dad. This is his philosophy. It's inspired millions of people throughout the world. If I could get that back within my grasp and be able to really showcase that out in the world the way I think it deserves to be showcased, then I should give it my absolute all. I'm so glad you did as our you know, all of the beneficiaries of, of learning more about the Bruce Lee philosophy. And, you know, I've had the honor of witnessing you innovate your dad's legacy over the last six or seven years since we met. And, and even last year when we got to celebrate what would have been his 75th birthday in Hong Kong. And you're bridging the past with the future and spreading this message that's so important. And as I've heard you say, you know, you feel that it's valuable to humanity and that's why you're doing this. It's not for the business, but how do you keep the legacy alive and, and how, what do you envision for the future? I think the important thing for me is that, um, we are just a company that is extremely mission based and, and in the flow of it. So I have this big idea that this overarching theme, which is that this philosophy, this human being has an energy that is still extremely alive in the world and helping people in the world. And to the extent that I can, uh, uh, utilize it and grow it and expand it as well as add whatever my own secret sauce to that formula is, um, to get it so that it is helping as many people as possible or, or healing as many people as possible. 
um, then that's the overarching theme. But but that's really big, right? Like, how do you get there? What and what is the vehicle for that? You know, that I think we're still figuring out. We have a lot of different irons in the fire. You know, we have our own podcast, the Bruce Lee podcast that we launched back in July of uh, 2016, where, you know, it's a free podcast. People can just get in touch with the philosophy and what that message is and how it applies to their lives. And you don't have to be a martial artist or into action sports or into filmmaking or action films. It applies universally uh, uh, to any and everyone. Um, so, so we have that as, as part of our arsenal. We have film and television projects that we're developing. We have the Bruce Lee foundation where we educate and, work on programs that help mentor and educate kids and, um, as well as, you know, adults and, and all of that. And so it's about continually, continually sort of growing, expanding and innovating all of these programs and figuring out what works and what doesn't work and just constantly trying to level up on all of it so that one day, hopefully we'll look back and go, wow, look at how many people we're getting this message out to and just be, I mean, I'm, I'm gratified when it goes, when one person gets it. (laughs) So I'm sure to know that it's getting to more and more people and helping more and more people. Um, you know, I imagine one day we'll look back and go, wow, look at how far we've come. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think you and I have talked about this before, but when we first met, (laughs) um, I was not very familiar with Bruce Lee. So I just thought of that Kung Fu guy, right? And then meeting you and learning more, and then eventually my husband working for you and the foundation, I realize and and what you're doing with innovating kind of the message or just extending the reach beyond um, martial arts, it's been so key for me and for so many other people to really understand the impact that his philosophy can have and that value. And just in a way, it can be your own religion, (laughs) you know, your own way of life. So I just am so excited to see you reaching new audiences with the podcast and with all the different things that you're doing production-wise, even Bruce Lee T, because the, the amount of impact and the benefit to people just extends and transcends beyond martial arts and beyond the entertainment. And, and I think that that's still being uncovered. Would you say you see that shift happening more and more? For sure. Definitely. Um, and I think it will continue to happen more and more over the next few years. Uh, you know, I mean, the podcast has been a great experiment for us. We didn't know when we decided to do it, whether, you know, there would be a big audience for it or not. And, you know, it's been out about five months and we're almost to a million downloads. So it's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. It's really, it's really been gratifying. And the people who write into us and tell us how they've been using the philosophy in their lives and how it's been helping them. It's, it's so wonderful. I mean, it, it just really, uh, makes it also worthwhile. But I think the important thing to say, which is, is what, you know, what you're talking about is that you don't have to be into martial arts to be into Bruce Lee. (laughs) And that's the message I kind of, I'm trying to get out to everybody that, you know, for those who don't know, his philosophy was all about self cultivation, self actualization, how to express yourself as the unique individual that you are in the best way out in the world and how to grow as a human being and not only grow as an individual, but an individual in connection to uh, the other people on the planet and your environment and all of that as well. So that it's what we call harmonious individuality, you know, and that this is the message and it applies to everyone and it applies to everyone who has a sincere interest in, you know, freeing themselves as human beings from their own, you know, uh, issues and obstacles and, and has an, in, 
and has an interest in growth and trying to, you know, attain a certain level of meaning in, in their lives, which I think most of us do. (laughs) So, um, there's definitely going to be more, especially as we get some of our media projects going. And, and, and the only reason, I mean, it's very much like my father in that, you know, he had a desire to share his love of, of martial arts and his love of his Chinese culture with the world. And his initial idea was to do that by having schools and a chain of schools and he would teach. Um, but then he started to realize that, you know, actually, you know, the, the media film and television is a much bigger, my Hollywood and all of that. He really wanted to show the world, like, this is what, a uh, Uh, a real Chinese man is, and this is what Chinese martial arts is, and this is my love. And so, you know, you reach so many more people when you have a movie or something like that, that everybody can go see. And so for us, it's a similar thing. And even though we've been able, you know, we could have put out movies a long time ago, but for us, because it's about making sure that the message is reflective of who he was as a man. And it's not just all about, well, how can we make more money? Um, We've taken our time and we've tried to find the right partners and we've tried to do it right. And so hopefully that's how it'll all turn out. (laughs) But, um, you know, that's what it means for us to be a mission-based company, which is why I said sometimes my why not is is saying, well, why are we going to say no to this? It's about holding to the core and our principles. So, and that's such an interesting take on the why not. Now it's it's kind of flipping it in, and also kind of looking at well, why not? Why not now? Why not me? Why not? What what's the worst thing that could happen? And um, what if? What if? And following that track down, um, and so much of of the philosophy that I've learned over the last several years seems to apply to being an entrepreneur <laughs> very well. And you find yourself, you know, you, you didn't necessarily go to school for business or to create your own company, but you've learned on the job over the years in so many different areas with film and with various products and licensing and all of these things. How would you say your father's philosophy has come in handy specific to the idea of entrepreneurship? Are there any ideas or quotes or anything that comes to mind that's helped guide you as an entrepreneur? Oh, for sure. Uh, many. Um, you know, I think one of the, um, one of the things that my father always talks about is being the eternal student, being always in a constant state of learning that there's that, Um, And then also, you know, he does talk about, you know, being in connection and relationship with others and, and also being, you know, a quality, uh, being holding true to the idea of quality and to the core of your purpose. And so all, all of these things have been very helpful to me. I mean, I really, as you, as we've said, I didn't go to business school. Business is not, um, what I started out and I have a degree in music of all things. And you're an amazing singer too, by the way, uh, which is just one of many talents in your bag of tricks, but carry on. (laughs) But what I love about it is I really spark to the idea of creativity and personal cultivation, like my father is always talking about. So for me, Um, I know what the mission is. My heart is aligned with the mission, which my father talks about um, all the time, too, that the first thing you need to do is rectify your heart in these situations and say, you know, is this what I want? Um, And is this does this speak to, you know, my my drive, my intent, my core, my passion, my purpose, all of that. And so um, and then you just need to really, um, get in that alignment and then start taking those steps to figure it out. It's a process. It is a creative process. And anytime, I mean, the be water, my friend quote, the whole thing is extremely relevant to entrepreneurship 
period, end of story, mm-hmm. because it's all about this idea of, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, I don't care if you've got the most awesome business plan in the universe, you're going to run up against obstacles. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you got to figure out how to, what your response to those things is going to be and how you're going to flow around them or surmount them or, you know, chip away at them and get through them. And I really love the metaphor of being like water. Whenever I come up against something in the business world that I don't know the answer to, then I have to go, you know, off on a little, you know, side tributary tributary and like find that out. And I need to seek out the people who know and just really be very, stable and okay with the idea that I don't know everything and that that's okay. But what I have is the ability to figure it out, you know, or find the people to help me figure it out. And then I can always make the decision of, does this seem right? Does this not seem right? Um, does this make sense? Does this, you know, and, and, you know, look at the numbers, look at the data, look at all that stuff, check in with my gut and make decisions based from there. But I don't have to have all the answers. I just need to be able to want to go on the journey to find the answers. That's, and, and talking about your experience prior to when you were mentioning the be water, my friend quote, and your journey with kind of just even being able to secure the opportunity to, to further your father's legacy was such a great tangible example. So I asked people on social media, you know, any questions for Shannon and one that, that a couple that really struck me, I mean, I had so many, um, one from someone, his name is Ian. Um, he said, if, if you could ask your father one more question, or show him one more thing, tell him one thing, what would they be? Whew, gosh, that's a hard one. You know, it's interesting because I, of course, I would love to just sit in engaged conversation with him because he was so, you know, he was so knowledgeable and so wise and, and all of that, I would just relish the uh, idea to be able to sit and like have a deep, meaningful conversation about life and the whole thing. (laughs) But, but what I would say is this, I think, you know, my deepest, deepest memory of my father, um, who died when I was four, is of this feeling of what it was to be in connection with him, to be in his presence, to be, to have his energy uh, focused on you, enveloped in, and envelop you, and to feel um, the sort of uh, strength and safety and, um, vibrancy of his love and, and affection. And that has set me up in my life so strongly to be able to go out into the world and, um, and feel like a whole human being. And at the same time, also feel like I know this man, like I'm in, I'm, I understand who he is and what he was trying to do. And I think that if I could have any experience again, it would, it would be literally to just be in his presence again and feel that close connectedness because I have no doubts about um, his love for me. I have no doubts about whether he thinks I'm really trying to, to do the be- my best by all of this and that I understand it. Could he give me some insights on some stuff? Sure. I mean, the, the place where I fall down a lot is I don't know a lot of those questions that people want answered, like, you know, what was his favorite food or, you know, like mm-hmm. how many hours did he sleep? And But I have my mom for that, you know. I mean, there's a part of me that would just like to – 
get a sense for for him but um in his like corporeal form you know (laughs) but um just to be in connection with that one more time and and feel so infused by it would be an amazing gift and I think it would just make me feel re-energized or more energized um about what I need to do, where I need to go. I think if anything, I would want to know, I mean, he was, he was so amazingly, uh, his work ethic and his drive and his passion was so focused in an incredible way. I don't know. I guess I'd, I'd probably want to know more about that. I'd probably want to know more about, um, is there anything he wished he'd done differently or anything like that. I mean, honestly, I don't think that there is because he used to say, you know, that success means doing something sincerely and wholeheartedly. And so to me, it's like, if we're doing that, then we're successful, right? I mean, whether we're have the big check in the bank account or not, if we feel, we feel fulfilled if we're really putting our heart into it. So I feel like that's exactly what he did is put his heart into everything. So it's just wanting to be in his presence and the simplicity of, of kind of your, your answer just rolls up and speaks volumes about the power of his presence. And to your point, one of my key takeaways in learning more through you, through Richard, my husband, and just reading myself, um, about him is is the intense focus and discipline and just consistent discipline and focus. And here we are today, you know, almost 2017, and and your dad overcame so much diversity, being a, a minority in Hollywood and, and all of these different things. What do you think his advice would be today with some of the, the resurfacing of um, – diversity challenges that we still face. And I, I remember seeing this clip of him talking about, this was years ago. He said, you know, 40 years ago in this clip, uh, he, he said, if you asked me if I could be a star in Hollywood, it would be a vague dream, but now it's a reality. And this had to have been in the what, maybe seventies. And then here we are today. And, and some of the things that have surfaced resurfaced, but also the progress that we have still yet to make, what do you think some of his thoughts would be or advice? Yeah, I think that in some ways, of course, there have been some amazing advances. I think, I think one of the reasons that Bruce Lee and his philosophy and the, and the way he lived his life are still so relevant today is because he was very much ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. I think that where we're sitting right now in Uh, you know, in the world, um, we're feeling a constriction and a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a, you know, backward pull. And I like to think of that in terms of, because there's a, a great shot forward that's going to be coming, that it's like the bow of an arrow where you have to pull it back in order to shoot it forward. So I keep keeping my positive thought and intention in that place and hoping that that is true. (laughs) It's a great perspective. And I love this. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's, uh, I love it. But I think he would be disappointed in the amount of separatism that is happening right now. He, 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 his energy was one of unity you know, he used to say under the sky, under the heaven, there's one family, you know, and that our uniquenesses and our differences, if you want to call them that, are to, are the things that make us special and the things for us to sort of uh, celebrate in one another rather than um, hate in one another. And I think he would be quite disappointed by the amount of discord that is happening in the world. And, um, but at the same time, um, you know, a lot of this coming to the fore and being so present right now is, is showing us what work needs to be done. And I'm sure he would be 
putting together a master plan <laughs> as we <laughs> speak. <laughs> and writing it, writing it down and just the detail and the amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's really interesting. And switching gears just for a moment and knowing how committed um, your father was to a healthy mind. How do you keep your mind healthy now? You're a mom, you're this entrepreneur, entrepreneur, CEO, um, the head of the, the board for the foundation. You also have all these other talents and people probably don't realize, but you, you really participate in a lot of the production of things and writing and, um, you've got a pretty full, full, busy life. How do you keep <laughs> your mind healthy, Shannon? <laughs> I think what I've learned as I've gotten older and uh, hopefully wiser is that my mind has to be in deep connection to my heart and my uh, gut and my soul. That I think one of the things, because there's such a celebration of, of knowledge and information and data um, and our minds can be very, very clever and inventive. But what I find is when you let your mind be the sole driving factor and the thing that's sort of controlling the whole game, you know, <laughs> the whole, the whole <laughs> organism, I should say, um, that the mind is, is not actually suited for that. The mind is, is a linear thing. It, it knows how to, um, analyze and, um, uh, think things through and process, but it can't be in the, it, it can't be in the main thing that's in control. Um, what really needs to be in control is more is your heart that your heart, your, your mind has a very linear energy and your heart has an expansive energy and you have to put these things in connection with one another so that they serve each other. And so that you can get that sense of satisfaction and, um, and contentedness in, in what you're trying to do. So I have tried more and more in terms of keeping a healthy mind. And especially as you age, I think in some ways aging is such a gift because you start to understand like it, maintenance starts to become a, a real priority. <laughs> Yeah. as the systems break down. Um, and you start to understand that everything is better. My mind is better. My bot when, when my body is better and my mind is better when my heart feels good. And I'm, and I'm, you know, in the right kinds of relationships and the right kinds of, um, settings and my heart, my mind is better when I give it some time off occasionally, you know, whether that's through meditation or whether that's through giving it the right kinds of tasks so that it doesn't, you know, we, we always talk about this like spinning effect that happens. Like when you get caught up in your stories and your tapes and you get this spinning activity that your mind sort of does where it goes round and round in circles and ties you all up in knots and, and, it's because I think you're not um, giving it the right kind of food. You know, you're giving it. Um, you gotta. You gotta sort of figure out how to have the whole machine working in concert, so that the mind can do what the mind does best. And you gotta get plenty of sleep and do all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> so good. I yes, I just learned a lot and and have such an appreciation for you to be able to articulate these things. And it's just a gift because some of the things you just said, it, you know, it, it makes so much sense. And, and having everything working together and in concert is um, sometimes it means letting go of the work and not trying so hard. Right. Well, it also means like we just actually, we were just recording an episode of the, of our podcast about this. It's about also not pulling yourself out of the experience. So sometimes what I mean by that is in what I mean by giving your mind some time off is a lot of times when we're in the middle of an experience, um, even especially if it's an awesome experience, like 
a beautiful, you know, sunset or uh, a joyous moment with friends or, you know, someone just brought out this amazing plate of food or whatever, you get this hit in your body where you experience this joy or this wonder or whatever it is. And you immediately, your mind immediately goes, how do we hold on to this? You know, what can I do? I got to, I got to take a picture of it or I've got to um, document it in some way, or I've got to like, I'm having this great experience. How do I hold on to it and keep it going? And in the process of doing that, you are starting to limit the experience because your mind is getting caught up in it. So in those instances, more and more, I'm just trying to, to go, you know, shh, it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to analyze this. Let's just be in the experience of it. Let's just really experience it to the fullest and then later, if we want to think about it and talk about it and how awesome it was, we'll have actually the full experience to go back and, and draw on. It's so important, especially with technology and how much we, we go to it as a, a crutch to try and, and capture those moments when you're right. It pulls us right out of, of the experience at the same time. And- And we shouldn't be hard on ourselves because the intention is the right intention, right? The intention is, oh my God, this is so awesome. How do I hold on to it? I want to hold on to it, you know, but in doing that, we're kind of pulling ourselves out of it a little bit. Makes sense. Makes sense. And, and one last question before we get to the final, why not now? And then that is something I've been, (laughs) I'm glad someone asked on social media because it's something I think I've been bugging you about for a few years now is. Someone said, will there be a book? Is there any talk of a Shannon Lee book? And so um, how, what do we think about that, Shan? Well, it's funny because it's actually is my final why not. Yes. Score. <laughs> I was hoping so. I yes. thought maybe I could plant the seed. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that then. I know that you have been <laughs> telling me for years now, you should write a book, you should write a book, you should write a book. I'm like, about what? Like, I don't know oh, what to write about. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, there are a number of books that, that are possible and can be written. And I think that, you know, for me, I know that uh, uh, one of the things that a lot of people are wanting or it feels like people are wanting when they're wanting me to write a book is, you know, what is the experience of your life as Bruce Lee's daughter? And so for me, I'm always like, eh, that's not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's just my own opinion, but anyway, um, but what is interesting to me is it, and it does correlate to Bruce Lee is the, you know, this experience of being on your own path and, and what that, what it means to be who you are. I mean, my father, part of his, um, sayings, one of his sayings was, you know, you need to start at the very root of your being and ask, how can I be me? And so I think as I've progressed in my life and had my own revelations and, and tried to apply and live the philosophies and been on my own path, I have definitely, uh, you know, have some experiences, I think, that are worth uh, investigating and sharing. I, I don't know. So I think what I my why not now is I've been sort of shying away from this idea of writing a book, even though I actually love to write. And there's a part of me that always wants to do that. And I think that for 2017, I do want to start focusing in on, on this idea. And I don't have like, I can't tell you this is what the book is going to be, but, um, I'm, I really actually want to put effort towards, um, this type of personal creative output and, and figure out what is it that I have to say? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what kind of, sparked you or what was the catalyst for the momentum to get to this point now Shannon because I know obviously there's always the time factor which I, I can't 
I'm not, I wouldn't believe you if you said, oh, I just have more time on my hands all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but not the, <laughs> not, not the case. If anything, it's the opposite. Um, what, this is your why not now, and this is music to my ears. Why? What, what got you here? I think there are a couple, couple of things. So, so first of all, over this past year, I have spent some time doing some more personal, creative projects and, and not writing projects, but just, and, and, and really coming to an understanding of how much personal joy and satisfaction they bring me. And so, so there's that, this, I, I would consider a personal creative project and knowing that a, I enjoy writing and expressing myself and b that I enjoy this type of puzzle um, because it really speaks to my creativity. Um, I, I think that focusing energy toward this would give me great satisfaction. Um, I think that I can, uh, it, it gives me a place to put some of that, um, you know, another way to, to keep a healthy mind is to, like I said, give it, give it things to think about that you, that you really want to to try and understand. And so, so this, what is it that I have to say is an important question for me. And I want to give my mind the ability to have the time to, to peruse that and figure that out. And I think it will, and it will be very much in connection with my heart and my soul and, and what, and meaningful to me. So I think it will give me a sense of joyousness and personal satisfaction to do that. And then secondly, I was going through some boxes and I found a notebook um, from when I was in middle school. And on the cover of it, I had written in my own handwriting, uh, eighth grade handwriting, Shannon Lee is spectacular. <laughs> I saw I think you might have post the, posted this somewhere. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> And so you found this notebook. And so I found this notebook and I thought, oh my God, there was a point in time when I felt absolutely 100% comfortable writing that on the front of my notebook for all to see and carry around in class. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it sort of sparked in me like, hmm, Okay, so you, you you know that was at a time before all of the noise got in the way. You know what I mean, and it just made me want to explore that a little bit. I notice it. I notice it in my own daughter, who is actually in the eighth grade right now, and who says all the time, "She's like, I'm awesome," and I'm like, "Yeah, you are." And I think, how do we get? How do we feel so? okay, to feel that and say that and express that. And then how do we wake up like 30 years later and not feel that way anymore? Absolutely. And it, it's such a, it's such an interesting kind of process you went through to analyze this notebook, to think about the mindset. You could have just kind of, you know, brushed over it and, and not thought it through, but look at the good that that kind of brought and what surfaced and going back to that unfiltered kind of just genuine you know authentic i guess back to self expression and authenticity oh, so interesting so that's the title right shannon lee is spectacular <laughs> And Lee is spectacular, and other things I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and other things I forgot. <laughs> and, thing, and other things adults forget. Exactly. Oh wow, this is this is great. I'm thrilled to hear this, and I know I want to wrap up here because we're over our time. But a few quick, quick rapid fire questions. One of which I think you have an unfair advantage on, but that's okay. Um, first one is, what are you reading right now or your all-time favorite book? Just the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I have a number of all-time favorite books. Um, I recently actually just got into this like strange book chain sort of thing where you had to send like a favorite book to somebody, and I sent them East of Eden by John Steinbeck which I just love that book. I read it for the first time when I was 18 on a train in Europe 
and it just stuck with me uh, all my life. Um, so I'll Good. choose that. There, there are a thousand I could choose, but um, that's one of them for sure. Um, what am I reading right now? I'm sort of in between books at the moment. I just bought a bunch of poetry. Um, I just bought some Hafez and some Rumi. I mean, I've I had some Rumi books already, but um, and some David White. And, um, I just bought a bunch of poetry books. So I've been kind of, I've dabbled in poetry a little here and there, just spontaneously on my own. I find it to be such a beautiful, expressive art form where you don't have to explain everything. You can just sort of like put the feelings down on, on a piece of paper. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm reading right now. Very cool. 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 And what keeps you up at night? Um, mostly like Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Sometimes maybe net Netflix and chill. Sometimes Netflix. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought you might say your daughter's, um, application to high school <laughs> process, but Netflix. I have to say I'm really the kind of person that, uh, I love to sleep. I cherish my sleep. And, um, there's not a whole lot that makes it hard for me to sleep. I'm pretty good at turning off my brain when I need to. Not all the time. There are things that, that get stuck in my craw, but as I get older, I get better and better at it. Um, so really what I'm a night owl by, uh, genetic code. And so a lot of times because I do like to get sleep and need sleep, I find myself just battling, uh, actually turning off the light and turning it all down and going to bed. Okay. This next one, pirates or ninjas, which are tougher? <laughs> this is no contest for me. It's ninjas. <laughs> End of story. I thought maybe uh, uh, we wouldn't even need to, <laughs> to uh, yeah, anything else you'd like to add? Are you pretty, pretty set on that? Uh, on pirates and ninjas? No, your choice is set, I know. But is there anything that you know about ninjas that maybe the rest of the world doesn't? Yes. Yes, I know many things about ninjas. Um, <laughs> here's why I choose ninjas. Because um, pirates have grit and they have, you know, they're jolly and they and they have that whole sort of like zest for life and, and, and bloodlust in their eyes, um, or what have you, which is great. Um, but ninjas have all of that and skill and discipline. And they are, um, they're masterful and, and they are, um, they, they have all of the sort of like, you know, combative, all of that, but they have, um, the ability, I think, to move in and out of spaces in whatever form they choose, detectable, undetectable. They have, uh, they have things in their arsenal that we don't even know about. Very mysterious. I love that mystique and slick. Um, okay. So last question, what advice would you give to your younger self? And you can choose which age that might be. What advice would I give to my younger self? Uh, so many things. Um, I think that I would have liked to have learned at a younger age. I, in particular, in particular, when I was a teenager, I was so, I was so plagued with so much angst as we all are. And, but I was so scared to, um, speak my mind and communicate who I, uh, was that I think that I would have just liked to feel, I would have liked to have more skill at just like being able to ask for help and communicate my heart, not be so scared of what other people were going to do and how they were going to respond to, to know who I was a little bit more so that I could feel more capable of, of just being myself at a younger age. Wow. That's, it's interesting because I, I 
I didn't know for sure what kind of your favorite quote was of your dad's. Um, before we hopped on and then I was researching and stuff, um, and there may be, I'm sure there are many, but the medicine for my suffering I had in me all along is what I have heard you say. And it, it's interesting how that applies, you know, to your to your younger self too and to that that point. Yeah, so it's all about, you know, like these tiny shifts in perspective. Like I just wish that at a younger age I'd had somebody to give me the the tools to sort of have and be able to like shift my perspective on my own and understand that the understand that I'm in control of how much suffering, internal suffering uh, I want to do or not do. What a to, and powerful thought to end on there. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your time, Shannon, and your friendship and everything. And I'm so excited about this book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. I give you permission to sort of like maybe like <laughs> once a quarter, just sort of like nudge me a little bit and say like, how's it going? How do what do you do? <laughs> I will. I totally will. You know it. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing too, because you are impacting so many lives. And and it's just really interesting to watch. I've, I'm fortunate for the point of view that I have and, and to see this kind of behind the scenes at times too. And um, it's it's powerful and important work. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and, and thank you too. I mean, you've been such a wonderful, um, sounding board and friend and, um, you are out there doing good works too and trying to, you know, create, um, make the world a better place. And I so appreciate that. So thank you as well. Well, we will have to do this again down the road and congrats on your podcast. I'll make sure that we include all the links to the podcast, to social in the show notes and, and get those well documented and out there. Give a shout out to Richard who I love and adore and who runs the Bruce Lee foundation and, uh, who does such an amazing job as well. So <laughs> Cheers to Richard. <laughs> Go check out the Bruce Lee Foundation and, and support if you can. <laughs> Absolutely. Good, good work going on over there too. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle and it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Now, water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. That's another one of my favorite Bruce Lee quotes. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Shannon Lee. You can hear a lot more from Shannon if you take a listen to their podcast, the Bruce Lee Podcast, which can be found on iTunes. You have brucelee.com for more insight as to what they're doing. And also the Bruce Lee Foundation, which is bruceleefoundation.com. All their social touch points are easy to find as well. And um, you can follow the legacy as it continues to expand and kind of innovate. It's pretty exciting. I had an interesting why not now moment and conversation with someone over the past week, and that would be my husband. So historically, my husband has been a musician, and he now is the executive director of the Bruce Lee Foundation. And he, about four years ago, went into studio and as a singer-songwriter, amazing musician, guitarist, he recorded his second album, and then he shelved it. So he's from Australia. I was actually in Australia with him when he was in the studio recording this album, and then life happened, kind of as it does. He moved to America, uh, had all these different opportunities and things come his way, and he shelved his album. And recently, he kind of had this why not now moment, and it was all about timing. And I think that that's one of my kind of key takeaways is that He's now finishing his album. I just listened to a few of the final mixes of his songs, and I can't wait to share with you. He's, he's incredible. Uh, but the shelving of this project was critical, and I think that if, if he would have forced it and continued to 
how to pursue the project at the time, it totally wouldn't have netted out the same way and it wouldn't mean the same things to him, but he just kind of, it wasn't ready. So one of the things that I guess I pose back to you is, is there anything that you have shelved, whether it's years ago, whether it's maybe weeks ago, who knows, that you've just put on the back burner. It's a creative project. It could be a conversation. It could be anything that you feel like you need to resurface. And maybe that's a 2017 thing, but that can be a why not now. It's bringing something back. So uh, I look forward to sharing Richard's music with you. And um, as for the Shelfie Club, a lot of the books that I have um, in the Shelfie Club, which is our book club, the idea is to take more shelfies, photos of your books, than selfies. The list of books that I've read over the last year uh, can be found at amyjomartin.com forward slash shelfie club. A lot of those I've used as, as holiday gifts this year. I love giving books because they're super easy to wrap. <laughs> and obviously, I love to read and I'm always talking about books. So um, if you're by chance looking for a very last minute gift, take a look at that and also Headspace. I know I've talked about it before, but it is the single best thing that I've done for myself this past year is invest my time 10 minutes a day into Headspace and that's the meditation app. So we are going to take a break next week and give everybody some time with their family and friends over the holiday and resume the podcast the first week of January. So enjoy the holiday season. One thing that I challenge you to do on New Year's Eve and something I've been doing for the last four or five years is take a piece of paper and draw three columns. In the first column, write down what I want to leave behind and make a list of anything that you want to leave behind in 2016. In the middle column, write down what I want to take with me, and make that list. And in the third column, write down what I want to create. And then take a photo of of that piece of paper, of those three columns, and when the clock strikes midnight, rip up the paper, use it as confetti, throw it in the fire, do whatever you'd like. Uh, But that's a fun way to kind of ring in the new year. And I like to do that at parties and gatherings. In fact, the back of my Christmas card, I had those things printed. So the template is there. But it's it's kind of a cool way to set your intentions. And you don't have to share it with anyone if you don't want to. But within those columns, there's probably a why not now. So we'll talk about that on the flip side in 2017. Happy holidays. I want to hear what your why not now is. Please share it with me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Amy Jo Martin. I'll send a signed copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Renegades Write the Rules, to the first 200 people who listen, rate, and leave an honest review of the podcast in iTunes. And you'll also get a free month subscription from our friends at Headspace. This is only available to Why Not Now listeners. Once you've left a rating and review on iTunes, just email your iTunes handle name and your mailing address to whynotnow at amyjomartin.com and we'll get your package in the mail to you. For detailed show notes, head to amyjomartin.com forward slash whynotnow. That's where you'll find links to things we discussed on the show, special offers, and how you can keep in touch with guests. Hat tip to my buddies Ash and Devin at Rock Salt Music for our tunes today. You just listened to the talented John Coggins in Let's Go and Let It Ride. And a jump high five to my talented husband, Richard Gruer, for producing the show and being patient with me. See you next time. Until then, why not now?